Hi there, it's Sherry Schreiber with more Naked Truth for you today. As soon as I got these hairs out of my eyes. Hi. I um, want to talk to you about panic and anxiety today. Um, panic and anxiety are feeling issues, or more specifically, non-feeling issues. So, in short, if we feel other emotions, if we're not dissociated or disconnected from them, we never develop anxiety disorder or panic attacks. Um, what I want to help you understand about this, because I've worked with a lot of people who have had panic attacks over the years and uh, successfully dismantled that issue with them. I don't work with anxiety disorder. I work with the underlying issues that trigger it, prompt it, keep it alive. So, um, So what it really involves is, and, and you can read my article on anxiety disorder on, on my website, gettingbetter.com, um, and the title of the article is The Panic Monster Doesn't Live Here Anymore. <sighs> um, but I've written about the basics of anxiety and, and how it comes about and how we keep it alive and how we perpetuate it for ourselves. So when you're having a panic attack, you're actually instigating it in ways that you don't understand that you're doing. And um, I want to explore that with you today. When I say that anxiety and panic are, are just non feeling issues. I mean that when we've disconnected ourselves since we were very young from feelings of depression or sadness or um, anger, rage, or frustration, you know, like when we're really frustrated, we say, it gets too overwhelming, we say, whatever, and shut down. That's disconnection from your own, very own emotions. So if we can connect you to your emotions without judgment, without censure, and help you stop being afraid of all these other emotions in your emotional repertoire, we can terminate your panic attacks. We can end anxiety once and for all. What people don't realize is that at their baseline, they may have come into this world with anxiety. Uh, maybe it's womb anxiety they inherited from their mothers, who throughout their lives, these mothers were worry warts. They were hyper-controlling and vigilant about their children's welfare or well-being. They were nervous Nellies. Uh, any small uh, scrape or bruise became a catastrophe, catastrophe, excuse me, for them. And, um, and, and sent these mothers into uh, uh, literally almost a state of either um, high intensity attending to the, the injury of the child not even taking time to comfort the child in his or her pain, but uh, uh, perfunctorily attending to that injury, or the mother got somewhat histrionic about the illness or the injury of the child. Oh, my God! Oh, my God, my child is sick! Oh, my God! Why did you go outside without your jacket on? This kind of shit went on. So, if this is who our mother was when we were children, this is who she was while she was pregnant with us. In one of my articles, well, actually a couple of my articles, I talk about in utero bonding with the birth mother. Um, in my article, Do You Love to Be Needed or Need to Be Loved? I talk about that and how we absorb her emotional states 
And if her emotional states are primarily uh, frantic, worried, uh, she struggled with feelings of unsafety um, and, um, and discontent and uh, fear or anxiety, that got transmitted to us in utero. So we might then enter into this lifetime with a generalized anxiety disorder um, and never quite feel safe in our world. We don't know why this is. It isn't because of some specific incident that happened to us as children. It's that we absorbed our mother's um, emotional states in utero, and this was the primary one that we were exposed to. At least that's my belief, my theory on this topic. Now, there are plenty of things in life that are triggers for us in context of anxiety. I mean, I had anxiety about starting to post, record and post these videos. I mean, I really, I was like, <clears throat> about it. And what about my hair? What about my makeup? And how am I going to come across and you know, all that other crap? <laughs> well, I decided to just put my vanity to the side <laughs> and do a naked face video and not give a damn about it, just practice recording these things. I felt like they weren't so bad. They were maybe worthy of uploading on my YouTube channel. But there are there are life stressors that can trigger anxiety. Uh, uh, some ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend stalking us, vandalizing our car or our house. Um, a lot of people are phobic about public speaking. I, I want to do a brief video on that too. I don't think I'm going to cover it today, but I might. You never know. And... Um, and um, roller coaster rides, uh, you know, some of us just can't handle those. And um, I, for one, was motion sick a lot as a child, got car sick all the time. And um, so rides like a roller coaster where it feels like my stomach is working its way up into my throat are not appealing to me. Those are not appealing sensations. <laughs> um, um, maybe you have a fear of giant spiders in your house or any kind of spider for that matter. And, and, uh, and this triggers anxiety in you or fear in you. So there are life stressors that bring about anxiety, but most of the time with people who struggle with anxiety, it's really at their baseline. It's, it's, they've lived with it their whole entire life. Now, the problem with that is that we want to naturally assign reasons to our anxiety feelings. So we feel anxious in the body. You know, I might feel a tightening in my chest and, and, and a little bit unsteady on my feet. And we want to go right up into the head and analyze it and attach meaning and reasons to it and search and search and search in our mind's eye for reasons why we're feeling anxious. This is a train wreck waiting to happen. Do not do this anymore. I understand you've been programmed this way to dissociate from your pain and your discomfort in your body by analyzing it in your head. And maybe you've had therapeutic experiences in the past that climbed on board with you and wanted to do that right along with you. But it's not the way to rid yourself of anxiety. So what we want to do, as I mentioned in Relieving Your, your Pain in one of my other videos, is we want to deep breathe into that anxiety, keep it in the chest, keep it in the body, and feel it. But stay out of your head about it. In other words, stop attaching meaning and reasons to it in your head. It's there at your baseline, just like for a lot of us, depression has always been there. 
Stop attaching meaning and reasons to it. Stop picturing what it's about in your mind. Just feel it, deep breathe, self-soothe. Okay, I'm starting to feel anxious. I'm going to stay out of my head. And I'm going to lean into that anxiety that I'm feeling in my body, that those anxious sensations, and I'm going to start deep breathing. And slowly exhaling. Very gradual, slow exhale. And at the same time, I'm rubbing my chest. Rubbing my chest where I feel that anxiety. And deep breathing into it, but staying the fuck out of my head about it. Because if you go searching for the fly in the ointment, the thing that's supposedly making you feel anxious, you're always going to find something to attach it to. It could be something big. It could be something trivial. But I assure you, most of the time, that's not the cause for your panic or anxiety. You're just feeling it in the body because it's there on a cellular level and we want to start moving it out of the body. So this is the way we do it. Slow, controlled exhale to the count of eight seconds. Big, deep belly breaths. And just feel it as a sensation in the body. That's all you need to do. What's going to happen now is you stop being afraid of this anxiety that stops haunting you. <laughs> There's no payoff in it for sticking around. You're willing to feel it. You're willing to experience it in your body. You're willing to self-soothe your way through it. And, um, and, um, and it will lighten quite a bit. Don't expect it to go away completely. There'll be a little bit left over, a little leftover anxiety. But it's, it's diminished enough to where you can live with it. You can go about your day as normal and usual, and you can get stuff done that you want to get done, and it's not going to intrude upon you. But if you go into your head and you say, okay, why is this anxiety coming up for me? Oh, is this reason over here or is that reason over there? Now you've set yourself up for a full-blown panic attack. We can always envision the things we're afraid of. Always. And as we envision the things we're afraid of, we give them power. We give them life. We literally breathe life into them. So, now you're feeling anxiety. And, oh Christ. You're feeling anxiety. And, um... And you go up into your head to figure out why that's been, you know, sort of your normal course of how you operate with anxiety. And now you seize upon why you're anxious and you start cogitating on all that. And most of this involves fast forwarding into the future and worrying about stuff that's never, ever going to come to fruition. My dad once said, 97% of the stuff we worry about never comes to fruition. And trust me, my dears, if you live long enough, you're going to notice how true this is. Honest to God, you will. 97% of the stuff we worry about never comes to fruition. The other 3%, whatever comes up, you'll handle it. Now, speaking of whatever comes up, you'll handle it. That's an anxiety mantra that I've given to my clients who struggle with anxiety issues. Um, anxiety mantra number one is whatever comes up, I will handle it. And this is to comfort the little boy or girl inside of you that felt disenfranchised or, or destabilized as a kid. And nobody noticed. Nobody comforted you. Nobody scooped you up into their arms and held you and rocked you and said, it's okay, I've got this. It's okay, you're safe. 
So anxiety number, anxiety mantra number one is whatever comes up, I will handle it. This is to reassure the child inside you. Um, when you think about emergencies, setbacks that have happened in your life, maybe your water heater broke and flooded your kitchen or your basement and it was a huge incredible mess and maybe you were in shock at first and you didn't know exactly what to do in the moment with that issue but it wasn't but a few minutes before you figured out who to call to help you with it or you determined a way to approach this problem whatever it was on your own or maybe your car stalled in the middle of nowhere um, but but you had a cell phone with you and you figured out who to call or you got on up on the main road and you and you decided to hitchhike and hope that a compassionate stranger would take you to the nearest phone whatever it was okay whatever the setback was as an adult you discovered if you think about it that you had resources you had resources to help you figure out how to respond to that emergency or figure out who to call to help you respond to that emergency. <laughs> but you had resources and you used them because you're bright, you're intelligent, you thought it through. I was out in my garage one day, I'm getting ready to go to the supermarket. I turned on my engine to warm it up in my car. And I was, uh, I was taking one of my leaf blowers <laughs> and blowing uh, leaves out of my garage and certainly out from under my car. And I noticed gasoline pouring out from under my car, just pouring out like somebody had punched a hole in my, in, in my gas tank. I, I, I literally was in shock. I couldn't think what to do immediately. And then it occurred to me, Schreiber, turn off the engine, <laughs> turn off the ignition. And I did. And the pouring gasoline slowed down. Turns out I had a faulty fuel pump that somebody had installed, a mechanic I don't go to anymore. But I'm like, shit! I was in shock. Okay, sometimes it takes us a few beats if something really comes out of left field at us and we have no idea how to deal with it. Okay. Okay, now, so whatever comes up, I will handle it. You know, I, I call my mechanic first. <laughs> they can't, they said, we can't get you in today, but, you know, we can get you in maybe after the weekend. Um and and I, but the bottom line is I had my I, I called my road service I had a flatbed truck pick me up because I have an older car and the bottom skirts plastic areas get destroyed with a regular tow truck and um, the guy pulled me out of my garage and took me over to my mechanic dropped the car there rented an automobile they, they came and picked me up from the rental place everything worked out okay I landed on my feet. But when we were children, nobody reassured us. Nobody said, it's okay, you're safe, we got this. Because a lot of times, well, our parents weren't terribly competent and they didn't have it. And so if they were destabilized, we were destabilized. Second anxiety mantra, you'll want to write this down. If I take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. If I take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. Now, this mantra is to remind the adult in you to stop fast forwarding into the future because this is going to trigger your anxiety every single time. When you leave right now, today, what's on your platter right now, and you start projecting into the future, you're going to set yourself up for an anxiety attack, a panic attack. So quit doing that shit. Now, one useful little tool is wear a rubber band on your wrist. And when you catch yourself in the act of projecting into the future, snap that rubber band good and hard. Feel it on your wrist, that sting. And start deep breathing. Okay.
because there are some important feelings there for you to experience which is the reason you're trying to leave what you're feeling right now and project into the future. Does this make sense to you? Maybe you're feeling a little flat, a little empty today. Maybe you're feeling a little depressed or sad today. Maybe you're feeling a little bored. So you get busy in your head trying to map out your future. You can't control the future. The future is an uncontrollable entity. You could think your life is really wonderful and stable, but, you know, what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? So all these plans you're making up ahead, uh, well, they become mood points. Deep breathe. Lean into those feelings. Self-soothe. Rub where it's uncomfortable in your body. You do this as soon as your anxiety is triggered. Do not attach meaning and reasons to your anxiety. Do not attach pictures to it in your mind's eye. Just self-soothe the anxiety. Deep breathe. Slow, slow, slow exhale because we want to keep that oxygen in the brain as long as possible to help us feel more centered and grounded. The long exhale, the slow, long, controlled exhale keeps us from hyperventilating and feeling dizzy. We don't want to get dizzy while we're deep breathing and fall off our perch. So that's why we slow down the exhale. It's very slow, it's very controlled. And the extra oxygen that's retained in your brain is going to help ground you, center you in your body, so you can tolerate just about any emotion. I mean, some of them are going to be tough, but... I'd rather have you be a feeling individual and a human being who can feel than a robot. Robots can't love. If a robot tries to bond with a human, it ain't going to work out. Third anxiety mantra, and I, I tend to use this one now and then myself. I say to myself, it's all going to work out fine. It's all going to work out just fine. And while I may not absolutely believe that in the moment, I'm flying on a little bit of faith that somehow the universe has a plan for me that I can't quite see yet. And it's all going to work out okay. It's going to be fine, is what I tell myself. So that's your third anxiety mantra. One, to soothe the child inside, comfort the child inside. Whatever comes up, I will handle it. Because you're taking care of you and that little boy or girl inside when you say this to them. Write these out. Plaster them around your apartment or house. Uh, stick them on your dashboard. Carry them with you in your wallet at all times. For when you start to feel anxious. And read them aloud. So anxiety and panic and even obsessive compulsive disorder, these are all non-feeling issues. It's non-feeling killing off of emotions that were judged as wrong or bad when we were children, perhaps. And we learned to judge them as wrong or bad or unacceptable as we grew into adulthood. The killing off of other emotions, the burying them deep, in the basement uh, is what prompts anxiety and OCD. So I tend to think of feelings as live things, like little animals, like little animal parts of me, okay? And if I have all these feelings that I was taught perhaps in childhood, to shun and, and avoid and run away from, and I was taught to judge them as bad or wrong or that they're unacceptable or that they're inconvenient for somebody else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock all these feelings in my basement, down in my cellar that's cold and dank and dark, and I'm going to stick them in little cages, and I'm not going to give them any food or water or light. And they could be down there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, these feelings. 
So maybe one little animal in that cage is depression. And another little animal in a cage is emptiness. And another little animal in one of my cages down in my basement or cellar is rage or anger. And another little animal down in that, locked in that cage in my cellar with no food or water for years and years and no light. And no warmth is maybe envy or jealousy or one of those types of feelings. But they're all human, natural, normal emotions, my dears. There's nothing wrong with them, contrary to how you may have been taught or related to when you were little. Nothing wrong with these feelings. They're just natural, normal human emotions. They're part of our emotional repertoire. And they're necessary. Anger and rage are like the most passionate, intense, vibrant human emotion you can have. If you kill off your rage and your anger... How are you going to be able to access sexual passion or any other kind of passion or creative passion? How are those going to stay alive? So the trick to eliminating your anxiety altogether and your panic attacks is to lean into those feelings in your body and stay the fuck out of your head. Really. Really. Quit looking for reasons why you feel that way. You only look for reasons to why you feel anxious because you think it's a wrong or bad emotion and, and you want to try and sanction the fact that you're feeling it because you judge it as wrong or bad or unacceptable and, and, and um, negative negative because it feels bad in the body, but it's just a normal human emotion. You need anxiety. I mean, goodness gracious. I, if somebody breaks into your home and you you happen to be home and, 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 and you sense that they are armed and, the, and they may have the intention to hurt you, aren't you going to hide in your closet? And aren't you going to try and just really make your breathing very shallow so as not to be hurt? So you don't get hurt or raped or killed? Of course you are. Anxiety is, is, is part of your fight or flight mechanism born with this. We come into this life with a fight or flight mechanism. This is our survive, part of our survival ethic. So we need anxiety. We just don't want it cropping up simultaneously at will whenever it decides to because it's at our baseline. Oh, another reason um, that you keep your anxiety intact is because sometimes it's the only way you can get out of bed every morning and get yourself to work. I've seen this in my practice. What's the payoff for holding on to anxiety? Well, if I didn't feel anxious in the morning, that I wasn't going to get to work on time, or that I was going to get fired from my job, I'd never get out of bed. So underneath the anxiety is depression that we're not wanting to feel. Does this make sense? So all of this stuff is interconnected when you have anxiety issues. Borderline personality disorder people um, usually struggle a lot with anxiety or anxiety disorder or panic attacks. Why? Because they've learned to dissociate, disconnect from their painful emotions when they're very small. So you can't feel aliveness in your body if you're disconnected from two-thirds of your emotions. It, it, it's just impossible. 
then you enter into relationships and you feel dependent on somebody else to put you on a roller coaster ride and manipulate your emotions all over the place just to have a sensation of aliveness. So they break through your non-feeling bubble, make you feel alive. And you feel dependent on them for that. When you start experiencing and feeling and tolerating your own emotions inside your own body, even the most painful ones, the ickiest ones like shame that I talk about in one of my other videos, you start to experience a sense of aliveness you've never known before. Well, you haven't known it maybe since you were an infant. But those feelings have always been there all along for you. You came into this life with them. So some people actually use anxiety to motivate them. And they fear that if they don't use anxiety to motivate them, they won't get out of bed. They'll never get out of bed. They won't get up and go throughout their day and, and do what they have to do. So oftentimes depression is underneath these anxiety attacks. We fast forward into the future in order to try and feel safer. We live in the future to try and map it out and control it so that we don't have to incur shock and surprise like we did when we were little and the rug got yanked out from under us way too often. Okay, that's enough for today. Don't want to overload you too much. Thanks for listening. God bless and goodbye for now.